Morning, Vivek. How are you? Nice to meet you for the first time. How nice. are you doing? Pretty Maybe good. you can explain to me a little bit about what Maycomb does. Yeah, Maycomb, um, our heritage goes back to uh, RF microwave. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, The company has been around for over 70 years, or almost 70 years, let me say. John o Ocampo, who's our chairman, he had a private equity company called Gas Labs. And using that, he acquired the assets of uh, Maycomb Semiconductor Portion, to call it Maycomb Technology Solutions. Since then, uh, we've transformed. We moved into 100G coherent optics in the 2011s, when, 2000, uh, when 100G was just starting to ramp up. We expanded our position and our business there and started to invest more in the optical side. Uh, we acquired uh, MindSpeed uh, to get a, uh, extension and capability into silicon germanium uh, technology because we saw that it's going to be very important, especially in enterprise and data centers. Then we made a very trans transformational move of a traditional semiconductor company moving into photonics. We acquired a laser company, Bine Optics, out of Ithaca, New York. And the uniqueness of Bine Optics technology is that they manufacture lasers using edge facet technology or EFT as we call it. So which is uh, very similar to traditional semiconductor manufacturing where the facet of the laser is etched and you can do uh, wafer level testing. Also go into higher wafer sizes like four inch. At the same time we also saw the importance of silicon photonics playing a role in data centers, inside the data centers first, and then even outside into the networks, you know, a core networks in future and so on. So we acquired a team uh, outside of Corning, New York, to focus them on developing silicon photonic technology. And the key challenge of silicon photonics is the integration of indium phosphide laser with silicon. And with Bine Optics and our silicon photonics team, we, in, we had close collaboration between the teams to come out with what is a LPIC or a um, technology where the laser is self-aligns passively onto the silicon PIC. Hmm. Okay? So this is a platform. Uh, we are starting off with CWDM4, going to expand, expand it to PAM4 and then move into even uh, things like 100G into core technology and also providing a solution for GPON OLT uh, in 10 gigabits, where uh, technologies such as EMLs have challenges. Then we moved forward in uh, building up our capability in photonics and light wave. We acquired uh, a company in Japan called Phibest, which was a leader in making TOSAs and ROSAs for 10G and then 100 gigabits. We saw the importance of packaging photonics, you know, fiber alignment, laser alignment as being a key technology. And then more recently, as uh, 100G bandwidths move into 400 gigabits and beyond, PAM4 technology is very critical. And we acquired Applied Micro APM about a year ago to give us the capability of uh, PAM4 and DSP and PHI technology. And then recently expanded more with high-speed photo detectors and PLC and such. Excellent. That explains uh, why, why we got together today, right? It's, uh, we use just about all of those, as you might imagine. Yeah, yeah. So, Maycom, you know, we play in all uh, the uh, optical networks. Yeah, so do we. Star yeah, <laughs> so it's a real great fit with Verizon because, you know, you've been leader in uh, PON, FTTX with Fios, with uh, 4G, with LTE, and now 5G LTE. I just recently heard about your announcement, uh, you know, installing 5G LTE systems. And also in Corrent, in Metro, you guys have been a leader. And in your networks, our components do go in all the way from access, spawn, uh, wireless backhaul, front hall, metro, long haul, and even and in your data centers. As yeah. you know, we're, we're now doing NGPON2 as, yes. as yeah. the new access, you know, as part of this one network where we're trying to create yeah. an access, a, a metro network, and a long haul network that is unified to carry all of our different services from all of our different business units. So all the way down to NGPON2, which is, again, has to scale at, at amazing numbers for us anyway. You know, I, I know that we're not the data center interconnect kind of guys who, yeah. who go buy thousands and thousands of individual devices that all sit inside of the same building, ours get spread out across the, the entire country. Absolutely. And, you know, Glenn, we are a semiconductor company. So our technology, you know, goes up through partners and 
module companies and system companies that supply to you. But the core technology comes from the semiconductor, as you know. So we are agnostic where our products end up. We enable uh, higher speed optical connections and networks. Uh, also, while uh, overcoming challenges that you see on reducing cost, increasing capacity, uh, and also scale is becoming very important because uh, photonics still is a boutique industry <laughs> or was regarded. It, so make come with our expertise, like with Elpic, where we self-align passively the laser with the silicon photonics using traditional pick-and-place machines and uh, traditional bonding equipment, you know, to create these optical interconnects. So uh, scale is very important, and we are trying to industri industrialize that. And, and it's yeah. been that that you that corner case uh, market, if you will, which kept the pricing high is also. And and the innovation's always been on the top end, right? How do yeah. you go from 10 gig to 100 gig? This was this was instrumental for us. We drove it really, really hard, and folks were saying, why are you pushing so much? It was because we needed the capacity. You needed to scale up the fiber capacity in order to keep a, ahead of the demand. Yeah. So those things have always taken you know, the, the front seat, if you will, or they catch the headlines, is how do you get to a coherent system and everything else? But the real volumes come in the access part of the network. Yeah. And, and that's where the cost pressures are such that you just can't afford to have traditional optics, if you will, play that role. I know the data center interconnect guys are, are helping us out a lot here too because sure. they're using a, a, a very high volume of what I would say are, are intra-facility or lower-end optic devices, and I assume that's your, your primary market? or So uh, that, that was, that's a huge market. I wouldn't say just primary, but it, volume-wise, it is the largest market. And if you recall a few years, a couple of years ago, when the pawn market was exploding and there was a capacity crunch, because of our EFT technology, we were able to scale in a very short time, increase capacity by four or five times, you know, and increasing, moving from like three inch wafer size to four inch wafer size, doing wafer level testing. So cost is very important for you as well and volume in the pawn and whether you're going to NG pawn two or whatever access networks are cost sensitive. Yeah, right? exactly. We, yeah. Uh, you know, we have at any given time six to seven million active customers, past 18 million in the ILEC footprint yeah. and continue to grow that in, in what we, uh, uh, we've announced uh, Boston and, and Sacramento now as, as one network, one fiber yeah. cities where we're going after the smart city environment. Sure. And when you start talking about in Internet of Things, yeah. uh, the the preferred way, of course, lots of things will be connected wirelessly. Sure. I mean, that'll be the ideal last mile connectivity, but yeah. that is uh, relatively short. And from that point, it has to get onto a fiber network in order to handle the capacity. So, Absolutely. as you might imagine, our, our volumes we see ramping up significantly. Yeah. Uh, but again, as you as you get further to the edge of the network, cost becomes more and more important. It, it always does. And, and and also the uh, you know the robustness of silicon photonics is something that we've we've taken note of. Yes. You know, it's uh, it's not just volume and low cost. It also has to be robust. You know, yeah. you, you can't afford to put something at that many locations. It's one thing to have um, compromised quality inside of a data center, if you will, where everything's interconnected and it's sure. all within one sure. building and, yeah. and it's easy to replace. More control. Yeah. More control. Yeah. It's another if you're putting it on top of a light pole, on top of a cell tower, yeah. or on top yeah. of a, a building somewhere, or inside of somebody's home. Right. Uh, when those devices fail, it's expensive to go replace them. You know, we Absolutely, and you know, you're installing 5G LTE networks, right? And there you'll need connections, even though the last mile is wireless, you need connection in optical, taking the bandwidth from your, exactly. from your towers and antennas you know, to base stations. And there, as you mentioned, you know, things like industrial temperature and all usage of photonics becomes critical. Very and, and so, again, I'll come back to our technology, unique technology of EFT lasers. Mm -hmm and silicon photonics can provide that. And Glenn, one of the key things, and that's where our strategy focused on, as I described to you all the different acquisitions we did, is to create all the building blocks of capability and technology so that we can optimize the different uh, components in the optical interconnect to provide you with the most optimum solution. You are facing challenges of you know, cost, performance, competition, uh, competition <laughs> everything. And, you need solutions from your vendors, system vendors, that have an optimized solution rather than trying to fit one bl black box from one supplier in with another one. Yeah. So that's where Maycom's value add really comes in. 
Good. is is really providing an optimum solution. Good deal. How about packaging? You know, I mean, it's one thing. Silicon Photonics has been a, a huge leap forward in, in functionality or capability, but packaging is still the, the gotcha in a lot of these things. Yeah, packaging and also uh, the performances of each component. We are still, we are a chip and a component company. We are a semiconductor company. That's our DNA and that's where we see our space and our long-term play. But in order to enable the solution, this becomes a key part of it. Yeah, so. yeah it's really uh, instrumental, right? If it doesn't exist at that layer, yeah. it, it's never it's going to. <laughs> exactly. You can't invent it at yeah. the system yeah. level, right? Yeah. If it doesn't yeah. exist at the yeah. component level. So yeah. I think that the other, you know, the, the, the far end of the, of the network, and again, I can't import the, uh, the difference between us and, and some other folks has been high reliability. You know, again, because it's expensive to go put something at somebody's house. Sure, it's sure. expensive to put it on a light pole. It's yeah. expensive to put it crazy places where they want 5G antennas in yeah. order to reach the, the customer base we're talking about for Internet of Things. Yeah. Um, some places that you won't necessarily want to go and replace things. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, there's, there's a lot of it, so cost is always important. But there's also the other end of the spectrum where performance really matters also. And that's where I think you guys are making a really good attempts to try and move up that scale too, right? From not just doing the, the access piece of it, but also doing more of the, the higher end functionality. Yeah. And in fact, you know, uh, you, you were the leader in installing uh, metro networks at CoreWrench, you know. Um, I think you also made announcements of using ACO from your system vendors, uh, pluggable current optics in your exactly. metro metro systems. In fact, uh, Maycom's drivers, we were the first ones to come out with the right uh, power and size uh, current drivers that went into those modules oh, very you good. Know, to enable that. And now also working on uh, increasing single lambda throughput to 600G, mm -hmm. which uh, I, I'm sure that Verizon will be a leader in installing those yeah, uh, before yeah, anyone it, else. It's yeah, uh, so. something that we need to take, like the ACO is a perfect yeah. example, right? In order to get the, the cost points where you needed them, it's one in a metro environment. Uh, again, if you're, you know, submarine has always been a premium because you needed relatively few of them and, and the revenue associated with it was, was quite good. Yeah. Um, long haul networks, again, you, you know, you can afford the premium, if you will, in order to get the performance. You get into metro and, you, and the numbers start to expand and we're saying we really want coherent functionality. Sure. We want that, that ease of use and everything else, yeah. but the cost has to come down sure. in order to, to justify putting it in everywhere. And the ACOs were a good piece of that. I mean, that, that allowed us to get the cost points down. Sure. And you mentioned silicon photonics. I don't know, are you also looking at a shorter reach, like 80 kilometers ZR type of applications at 400G? We do yeah. from an access point of view. Yeah. Now, 400 is okay. a little bit different than 100. You know, like I said, we pushed really hard from 10 to 100 because we needed it. You know, we really needed the, the additional 10x capacity. When you go from 100 to 400, it's more of an optimization play than yeah. it is a raw capacity. Yeah. Uh, in an access environment or between sites like that where you're talking single reach, yeah. for us, we're, we're a bit different than the data center guys, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, the data center guys have huge demands, and I imagine that's where you'll see the, the volumes come from. Yeah large demands between two locations that are generally in that neighborhood, you know, 40, 60, 80 kilometers apart, uh, where generally our central offices or our facilities are closer than that. They're not that far apart, uh, and the demand is much more spread out. Right. So the volume comes in in 100 different locations as opposed to two locations with 100 devices in it. Sure. And uh, uh, the distance is, is important to us. Yeah but it's also uh, more in a distributed fashion, so that it comes in a bit of a different... Yeah. So you mentioned silicon photonics and your need for reliability and performance. So, you know, as I mentioned, like the LPIC, you know, if I can describe it, it's really taking a laser, flip chipping it, and putting it in the silicon, on the silicon where there's a cavity there, where there are a mechanical alignment structures with a laser. So there's no lenses, isolators, anything between the laser and this rest of the pick, okay? So this increases reliability by magnitudes because you've eliminated many of the moving parts. Yes. As you, as you know, we've worked on reliability longer than, yeah. right? It, so it's by key, right? The, having the, yeah. not only the fewer parts, but also the, the um, connections between them, right? Yeah. This is, the, this is so usually and, the and weakest link. 
and it's all by mechanical structures of the silicon, all lithographically de defined. Mm -hmm. And our silicon, our, our laser, also because of edge facet technology, has mechanical structures on it. We can actually define mechanical structures that match with the silicon mechanical structures. So this is also going to be used in the pawn networks and then uh, in future in coherent, coherent networks too. Right, yeah. right. But it's, uh, it's again that, that inherent reliability yeah. that you get with adding all the devices as opposed to discrete components, right? Yes, discrete yeah, parts absolutely. as we've seen across uh, generations of equipment. Yeah. The weakest link is always the connection between them. You know, a lot of times it's not necessarily the laser that failed, it's the connection of that laser or that device, that diode or whatever it may be. Yeah, and also another thing is performance. So by passively aligning, you know, we've, we've optimized the coupling of the silicon with the laser mode fields where you get high coupling and consistent coupling. Mm -hmm. So the, by having that level of coupling consistently, the power of the laser can be managed and optimized. So ultimately, uh, if yeah, you don't have to lower power consumption of the yeah, system. Yeah, you don't have to redline it in order yeah. to get the uh, the acceptable amount of power out exactly. to to meet yeah. qualification testing right of the device. I imagine your yield is better, and therefore, cost and manufacturing yes. and everything so, else goes down. So we've really, Glenn, in a way, um, industrialized boutiqueness of the photonic and light wave components. That is really our intention. And coming from a traditional semiconductor background, we have that heritage and the background. And combining it with our light wave and photonic know-how, we've kind of optimized and, and combined the two right. to, to really make a game changer right. and here. I, and I believe it's, you know, we're finally at a point where, where hopefully the industry can support that type right. of investment, right? Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, in the past, it's been difficult to say. It, you know, it was a niche market, as you say, but it also had niche players, and uh, we weren't buying enough. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, to be honest, on the receive side, it was always, okay, uh, how, how are you going to use more of this devices? And, and it wasn't available. You know, you weren't scaling it to you as yeah. we are today. I think the data center guys have really helped. I think the access environment yeah. has really helped. You know, when we started Fios, uh, we were the only ones out there, you know, Absolutely, kind of uh, yeah. plowing fiber into the ground, and everybody yeah. wanted to know what that, what that red, <laughs> what that was, yeah. as opposed to the copper cable that any, everybody else had used. And everybody else was skeptical, you know, is that really going to work? But I, I think we're seeing that a decade later, other folks are saying, yep, I guess we really do need to get fiber as close to the customer as possible, yeah. even if it's not right inside the, the building. Although for us, traditional fiber, we don't even put the ONT on the outside anymore. We want it going all the way into the living room, if you will, because we eliminate those multiple connections. Yeah. And, and that's how you improve the quality and, and consistency. And I'm sure with increased bandwidth, uh, the insatiable demand of the consumer uh, is forcing you to get closer and closer. And right? once you so, get a fiber <laughs> to that access point, right, all, you're done. You know, you, you, you may have to change the endpoints. You know, no, undoubtedly there'll be uh, evolution of bit rates or functionality and you got to change the endpoints. But that infrastructure is good. You know, it's yeah. good for the rest of our lifetime anyway. You know, it's, I would say, it's something the kids will have to worry about someday or grandkids on what they might go replace that. The fiber truly is a substantial amount of bandwidth or enough, infinite amount of bandwidth for access. You just yeah. won't run out. And, and quality wise, it's also very robust. Sure. You're optimizing your technology and your business innovation, basically. Yeah. And so where we play is we come so much low on the food chain, but really enabling technologies to enable you for these different architectures. Yeah, exactly. Without the, without the low-cost components, you just don't get there. Again, if every one of those devices used to be, you know, in a long-haul environment, uh, uh, you know, $50,000 for a single device, and you're going, well, that, that makes sense if I can aggregate a lot of customers on there, but if I've got one customer yeah. <laughs> who's only, especially in Internet of Things, who's not paying me a lot of money yeah. uh, per device, got a lot of devices, the cost model has to be completely different in order to enable it. And scalability, you know, you, you'll need, um, you, it's not like, you know, you can give lead times of several months, right, yeah. to a supplier. So flexibility in supply, scalability plays a key role. And where Maycom, we have uh, really built a portfolio of technologies that we work with. We are not restricted to one or the other whether it's gallium 3.5 technology, whether it's silicon germanium, whether it's CMOS, whether it's silicon photonics, you know, we are playing with, we are actually have capabilities in all these. So we can 
optimize the right technology or work on the right technology for the right um, benefits and right, applications. Right, right application so, because they so, will evolve, yeah, right? They, and, yeah. and like anything else, there's going to be there's not one solution for everything or else we would have already figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. problem is there's lots of different solutions for a lot there's of no different applications. There's no one size fits all. Exactly. Right? So. Vivek, it's been great talking to you this morning. I, uh, I learned quite a bit. I appreciate it. Likewise, Glenn. Thanks for your time. Take care. Take Thank care. You. Bye.